Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our podcast entitled Difficult Conversations, Sex Work and the Academy. So my name is Poppy Gerard Abbott. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Edinburgh, looking into sexual violence in UK universities. I'm also a sociology teacher, and I'm the principal researcher on a Scottish government funded project for the Emily Test charity, which is aiming to create a gender-based violence charter for universities. And joining me today is my good colleague and friend, Eva Duncanson, who is a PhD researcher on sex work at the University of Edinburgh, specifically cam girl work. And today we're going to be confronting the political tensions in our feminist movement and running the podcast as a bit of a Q&A session on all things sex work and university. So we're going to be looking at sex work research in academia, the issue of students and sex work. And we're also in the context of uh, the times we're in going to be discussing sex work and the coronavirus. So loads to unpack there. We're rolling together a lecture that we were meant to be delivering for a module at the University of Edinburgh called Intimate Relationships and also a presentation slash live podcast that Eva and I were due to deliver at a conference called Conference for Change. But because of the virus, that conference has obviously been cancelled. So we're going to be combining those two um, those two talks that were meant to take place into this cosy podcast, which hopefully will be a welcome change to uh, monologues on YouTube <laughs> that um, will ensue as next week rolls um, onto online learning for all of you. So welcome, Eva. Hi. Hello. So... I've um, already touched on your um, your research area a bit, but would you like to uh, tell our listeners a little bit more as much as uh, you would like to share about methods or your vision for the project? Yep, sure. So my research looks at the creation of intimacy and ideas of co-presence in commercial webcamming. Um, the internet has changed a lot about the way we work and the ways that we consume. So there's a need for immediacy and quick fixes and endless choice. Um, webcamming provides that in a way that most sex work industries can't even compete with. Um, and with so much of our communication moving online, so does our creation of intimacy from long distance relationships to Twitter friends. We're connecting and relating to each other with constantly evolving technology. Um, and now we factor in all this advanced tech that's becoming commonplace. We have haptic technology literally at our fingertips and we can interact in completely new and exciting ways. And all of this is available to those on webcamming because um, it's full of interactive elements which build intimacy between webcam models and clients. So it's really the perfect time to be understanding the industry and also sex work more generally in the modern age. It really is a new way of understanding intimacy, completely removing traditional physical contact. Now, how we view physical contact with technology is kind of up for debate. I mean, we now have the ability to physically touch each other through the internet. I mean, we've had the very first virtual handshake take place. Um, and now we've got... Really? Yeah, yeah, we've got that. Um, so we've got like interactive sex toys that kind of can trigger responses from thousands of miles away. So how we understand physical touch has really changed quite dramatically. Um, and as for intimacy, it really is becoming a lot about how to get to know somebody so like personally over the internet without ever having met them in real life and without having you know shared the same physical environment. Um, it's really throwing a lot of kind of traditional ideas of intimacy and relationship completely up into the air. Moving on to feminism what is going on in feminism when it comes to sex work so let's um let's look at the broader feminist movement and, and take a couple of steps back so we saw in the 1970s and 1980s these so-called sex wars that have been otherwise referred to also as the porn wars. And this was a period of uh, division and, and discussion and conflict among feminists around 
what the relationship should be between feminist values and sex work and sex workers. And I think this is a for me, this is a particularly interesting uh, historical moment to study because, in my opinion, we're, we've seen a resurgence of the sex wars at the moment with a kind of re-energized conversation among feminist activists and theorists and researchers around not only uh, how we should interpret and accept and theorize sex work but also trans rights so i think there's a bit of a link there between there being a perceived threat uh, to feminism from having uh, trans activists and trans people at the feminist table and also having sex workers so w what do you think of of the sex wars and of our current times in feminism I mean, the sex wars really remain this divisive issue in feminism. Um, currently, I would say the split is between a decriminalization and the Nordic model, or which is partial criminalization, as well as some people supporting full criminalization. Um, so this is an issue that kind of keeps coming to the surface at every given opportunity. Um, we can see the, the Labour leadership candidates, for example, were all asked their views on sex work as have all the US Democratic candidates, some of whom have even reconsidered their position in recent months. Um, but it does feel that progress is still slow. We're still hashing out the same arguments again and again as we were in the 1970s and 80s. So with 10 years now of the Nordic model in Norway and having seen the damaging effects on the lives of sex workers, particularly with racist and xenophobic undertones, it does feel like we haven't moved forward that far. So let's unpack some of those arguments for our listeners. So broadly, what would you say are the, obviously this is speaking in a very kind of rudimentary sense, but what are the broad arguments for and against feminism being supportive of sex work? So as listeners may come across quite frequently in media and uh, feminist narratives about sex work there is a view and quite a widely i would say a widely held one that sex work is inherently violence against women because of the trafficking practices that happen uh, within sex work industries and the portrayal of women and of sex so what do you think are the other critiques so i would say those on the decrim side tend to and this isn't unanimous but tend to be sex positive feminists in which case they view kind of sex is whatever the value that we impose on it is it doesn't you know um same with bdsm tendencies as well these do not have their own inherent negative or positive values so i'll start with the the four arguments for kind of a decrim position and feminism so I think it's important to remember that sex workers have really been at the front line of feminist and LGBT movements from the very, very start, particularly trans sex workers. I think their role could not be more valued um, and, and how they've helped to push things forward, um, particularly with Stonewall, for example. Um, and in terms of decrim and feminism, I think it's important to remember that we want to trust women and sex workers to under know their own agency and to be able to say that they are happy to work for you know they're choosing to work this way i think it does recognize that we are living in a patriarchal society and that there is violence so why do you think that sex workers and sex work should be welcomed into the feminist movement the against arguments are that sex work is inherently violence against women, not only in its portrayal of women, for example, through pornography, but also through its portrayal of sex as patriarchal. So uh, something that men are entitled to and women as sex objects. And there's also a belief among uh, feminists who are critical of, of sex work or don't see sex work as, as having any place in the feminist movement and 
uh, a view that feminism should be uh, rejecting sex work as uh, you know, in a future for where women are liberated and have equal rights. The view is that as long as women can be, in inverted commas, purchased, they won't be free and they won't be equal. And there are also feminist concerns about the, the presence and, and the role of, of trafficking uh, chains of children and women within the sex work industry. So... The complaints seem to be around um, sex work being inherently violence against women. So uh, it is inherently exploitative of women because of women being bought. And um, there are also concerns about the practices that are, are going on. And then broadly, the arguments uh, for a sex work inclusive feminism is that sex workers have always been uh, as and also uh, trans sex workers have always been at the forefront of of fighting for for women's rights because they have experienced so much violence and marginalization and the argument for uh for welcoming them into the feminist movement is that feminism is about challenging systems of of violence and oppression and inequality and power and the ways that we that we treat sex workers and we treat sex work um, are our patriarchal views of how sex operates um, and um, and of the workplace. So, do you have anything to say about that? I think that sums it up quite quickly. I think it's always important that we understand that any anti-sex work policies are really, again, putting controls on women's bodies. And this is something that feminism has always tried to fight against. And it seems counterintuitive that we are rehashing these arguments, whether women and other sex workers should have control over their bodies or not. Um, I think you, you summed it up quite well there to say that, yes, we're working under a patriarchal system, but to, have, to be able to have control is the, the main thing. Yeah, so why do you think that an increase in sex worker rights should be a feminist objective? So some feminists seem to think that by increasing sex worker rights, we are um, diluting feminist aims and we are intertwining sex work too much with the feminist movement and that a feminist future would be one where sex work doesn't exist. And then the alternative perspective is that the violence that sex workers face and the precarity and poor rights and poor protections are symptoms and outcomes of a patriarchal society that legitimizes violence against women and a future where sex workers are treated with respect um, and are given rights and proper pay and secure contracts and safe places to work is very much part of a, a feminist future because sex work isn't going to go away and people uh, purchase sex work for a variety of reasons other than misogynistic reasons. So why do you think that an increase in sex worker rights um, is, is conducive to uh, what a feminist future would be? So when we increase rights, and I think it's actually important to take out views on sex work when we talk about increasing rights and looking at models regarding sex work, because it needs to be an evidence-based approach. And currently the evidence is showing that any level of criminalization hurts sex workers, particularly hurts women, trans women, and other people in the transgender community they are being damaged by criminalization policies and that really is a feminist issue whenever any aspect of it is criminalized it pushes everything further underground it makes it harder to report violence and harder to get support when needed it means taking on more risky clients going into more risky environments and that's something we really want to avoid um, i was going to talk about trans rights particularly around sex work or did you have a question on that the original question I asked when we were talking about feminism was um, how is the negative reaction to sex workers also intertwined with the negative reactions that we're seeing towards uh, trans people? 
So over 80% of transgender people who are murdered are sex workers, showing that there's a really clear relationship here that makes trans people particularly vulnerable to violence. Um, furthermore, so many of the people opposing decriminalization are the same people who push for damaging policies against trans people, or more simply, if you're a swerf, you're probably a turf, and misogyny is running through both. So can you explain those acronyms for our listeners? So SWERF is Sex Worker Exclusionary Radical Feminist, and TERF, which is probably the, the more common one you see on Twitter, is Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. And they apply to people who do not believe that sex workers or transgender people should be in feminist movement. So what misogynistic views do you think uh, underpin SWERF and TERF uh, viewpoints? When we look at people who've pushed against sex worker rights, they tend to be also working with people who push back women's rights altogether. We're talking about things like such as access to abortion, um, just control over women's bodies. These issues are so entwined and it, the same imply um, is tied to transgender people as well, particularly trans women. Their bodies are so scrutinized and now being covered in legislation. We're just putting all this control onto how, we, how we're expecting women to be and to behave. The issues are just so tied together. Do you think that a feminist future would have sex work in it? This is a really controversial question because I know within the decrim decriminalization movement, there are really divisive views on this. I can't help but feel that, yes, there would be sex work in this future. Um, for instance, the, the writers in, of the book Revolting Prostitutes, that's Molly Smith and Juno Mack, I believe that they do not think there would be sex work in this future. Yeah, I argue that there are people that I've spoken to that enjoy what they do. They get, for instance, pleasure of performing, of getting to work with people, of making people happy. Um, they enjoy providing a service to clients that maybe wouldn't have this opportunity um, without sex work. And there's a lot of people that do get true enjoyment out of their work without having to push, and say in inverted commas, the happy hooker narrative. People, there are people who still enjoy the sex work. There are also people who do not enjoy sex work. And perhaps these are the people that would not be doing it in this future when they had, you know, access to you know, safety of like, a home. They had money. They had, you know, be able to feed their families. Maybe that's what we should be focusing on. For me, this is one of the most uh, significant learnings that I've had since studying um, sex work and talking to sex work activists, that the sex work industry is so broad and is as diverse and human as any other workforce. And the representations of the industry are very dehumanized that everybody is um a, a full service sex worker um out on the streets and telling everybody that they're loving their jobs when secretly they aren't so i think the narratives have been seriously homogenized about sex work and from just even if you expose yourself to a snippet of voices from sex workers and, and particularly you know open sex workers sex work activists you will see that their work is you know there's parts of their work that they hate there's parts of their work that they love like any job and there are parts of their work that are precarious and parts and that obviously is uh, on a scale that is shaped by social characteristics like any job so if you're black or trans or you know a woman of color or disabled then you're more likely to be in the more dangerous and precarious end of the spectrum than if you are, say, uh, white and able-bodied or um, you are from a more uh, middle-class background or your work is more privileged in the sense that you're not having doing a full-service sex work that involves um, uh, contacting clients uh, on the street, which is the, the representation that seems to have engulfed all sex work but actually that that's one part of sex work and that's the part of sex work that sex work activists 
would like to see really changed and, and those workers protected. So I think there are, even if, my view is that even if you um, disagree with, uh, femin with, with sex work being in, in a feminist future, why should that not mean that in the interim, we are increasing sex worker rights and protecting them from violence and protecting them from murder and making sure that they're safe and that they have access to reproductive services. I think that's absolutely within the scope of, of feminist aims, regardless of whether you agree that uh, a future of women's liberation would include sex work or not. Yes, I have to agree. I think it's important to take the politics out of it sometimes and just look at the practicalities. What would make people safer? What would make the most vulnerable people, some of the most vulnerable people in the whole of society safer, protect them from violence? And if we take an evidence-based approach without getting into the, the morality, the, the thoughts on a future without sex work or with sex work, we can really look on what matters now and what protects people now. I understand why ethics and morality and politics are part of the conversation because everything is ethical, everything is moral, everything is um, is political. So I think it can be quite hard um, to separate those things. But I think that any any woman, any group of women that are that are disproportionately at risk of violence are absolutely welcome to the feminist table. And I think that that is the, the core principle that should remain at the forefront of uh, answering the question, who is welcome at the feminist table? Yep, I absolutely agree. So you were talking about evidence-based approaches. So let's move on a bit to sex work research and uh, the theorists that you love. So. In universities more widely, but also at our own institution, the University of Edinburgh, there are very, very few people researching sex work. Why do you think that is? I think when it comes to researching sex work, again, a lot of it is now, a lot of our time is now spent defending our position around sex work, either for or against a decriminalization. And therefore, we spend a lot of time having to debate this, like the same arguments again and again. You can't even write a paper without having to kind of state your position. So it's becoming increasingly political. No matter who you are and how involved you are with sex work research, you end up having to take this position. And that means you, a lot of less time is actually spent in reflecting on our research, how best to benefit the community that we are researching because of this high, highly politicized environment that we're working in. There is also um, people who don't even recommend touching sex work research because it can get picked up by the media. It can be looked down on in institutions. Um, I believe it's the academic Ramona Curry says it's inadvisable to teach porn if you don't have tenure because it's just so damaging for your career. That's why people are probably less likely to want to go in and have anything to do with sex work research. And how do other feminist academics perceive your work? Because from my own observations, I see that similar conflicts and arguments ha happen among feminist academics, um, as we see among feminist activists, where trans inclusive and trans exclusive and sex worker inclusive and exclusive feminists are seriously mistreating each other and hurling abuse at each other which in my opinion is is so um damaging to the movement i think it's distracting from the uh the things and the forces that we should be hurling that <laughs> energy at which is um the dismantlement of women's rights and reproductive rights and you know obviously speaking in sociological terms, the white hetero patriarchy, that's where our energy should be, our, our opposing and, uh, you know, our resistance energy should be focused towards. But we're hurling it at, at each other. And I'm, I'm concerned that there's this 
divide and conquer effect that's happening in the fe the feminist movement at the moment, where feminists are are investing their time and energy into uh, hurling abuse at each other rather than focusing on a collective aim, which is a future where th that women can where women can live free from from male violence and uh, enjoy all of the rights that men do. So what do you think about the the tensions among feminist academics and, and how are you treated? So I would say the responses I've had to my work have been mostly positive. Um, but I would also say that's partially down to where I choose to integrate myself because the, the most helpful feedback I've had was when I was um, at a conference, which also had sex workers there. So I was able to speak to students and academics who've done sex work or are in sex work currently, as well as people like myself who are researching sex work. And those are the opinions I, I care about most. And those were the, the this, that was the feedback that was the most beneficial for me. There are always going to be people that disagree with you. Um, I mean, I have been told that I personally am responsible for objectifying women because of my research. Um, but for the most part, it's been positive. But then again, I do trend, tend to avoid some feminist spaces because I do feel that I don't want to get involved in that empowerment, coercion, dichotomy that we mentioned earlier. It's just not an argument that I want to keep having every time I want to discuss my research. So I, I guess it's partially because I'm almost shielding myself from having to go through that debate again and again. I think this empowerment oppression dichotomy is engulfing the feminist movement and my personal perspective is that like all work sex work is not inherently liberating or empowering or inherently liber um, oppressive yes um i would say the same thing i mean there's so many different jobs that have elements of oppression in them what I do like to kind of explain to people is I've, I mean, I've worked in a supermarket and in this supermarket, I had money thrown in my face. I was harassed. I was stopped. I've had beer and milk thrown over me. And I don't see how anyone could think that that job was empowering. I had panic attacks working, having to deal with the public treating me like this from both men and women. And it just, I can never understand why people would say oh they should get a real job when what their jobs are on offer like what job is truly empowering yes especially within this rotten capitalist society right what exactly. what job is going to give you full protection full rights full flexibility treat disabled people with all of the respect and dignity that they deserve and that's why i would like to see sex work situated within broader critiques of of capitalist workplace practices yes yes agreed so what are the um just finishing up on the topic of uh researching sex work what are the other what are the methodological and ethical challenges in your work so i know that recruiting sex workers to research can be near impossible because of the lack of trust and um, faith that they have in authorities. Do you have anything else to say about why sex workers are so pessimistic to, to participate in research? Is it that the researchers themselves always have to be sex workers um, because it's just too it's just too methodologically challenging otherwise. So sex workers have good reason to fear academics. There have been countless um, articles and pieces of research done that have actively manipulated or lied to sex worker participants um, and used this evidence to push for policies that harm sex workers. This has led to a, a big uh, push back against non-sex worker academia and they don't want to get involved unless they feel that their response their, their responses are going to be represented fairly um, I was very aware to this going into the research um, as somebody not in the community I was then having to go in through Twitter 
as I felt that this was the best option for trying to access an online community. Um, and I spent a whole year building up trust and communicating with sex workers before I even started recruitment. Um, so through this Twitter account, it was completely under my own name. Um, I was discussing sex worker politics and kind of gaining followers and having these conversations under all under my real name for full accountability. So that meant by the time I was recruiting participants, they were aware of what um, who I was um, and they could kind of check my credibility. Um, throughout my research, I also had frequent feedback from participants. Um, and this is, was an ongoing process. I'm still continuing now. So from the point of the interviews all the way up to when I submitted my master's dissertation, I had feedback through that entire process to make sure that I was fully representing their experiences, as well as making sure that they were happy with the level of anonymity that I was giving them. Yeah, I'm interested in how the marginalization of sex workers in research is an issue of epistemological uh, inequality and, and privilege and violence where largely um, women in the academy who are in quite privileged positions or often very privileged positions are taking um, representations of sex workers and presenting them in ways that don't capture their voices or represent their, their voices as um, as they desire. So there seems to be a lot of unethical practices that are going on that have a specific, also interestingly, have a specific agenda of, of steering uh, data and the representation and portrayal of, of sex work research towards an abolition model and towards this all sex work is violence against women narrative. Yes, um, that tends to be the way and it's has done a lot of damage for people who want to do sex work research because it means that distrust is there. Um, amongst the sex worker community, they will discuss if they are approached by somebody to do research. They will discuss it with other people to see if they've also been contacted. There's a really tight network um, within some different communities of sex work and therefore they can check and make sure that you are who you say you are and they will and now we're in this internet age, you can find out information about people at the you know, touch of a button. So we will, they will check to make sure that you are, you know, on the, on the right side of the, the sex work wars. I'm so interested in how those tight networks are indicative of the relationship that sex workers have with justice and policing uh, authorities so it's almost like they because of the the poor relationship that they that they have with the outside world they've almost created their own models of policing and protection and and justice there's um there's a case recently um and if you search i believe it's the hashtag joey the player this is a notorious rapist of sex workers who has been re actually reported to the police a number of times by those who risked facing um punishment themselves they reported them to him to the police and no action was taken they couldn't find him he was a notorious raper to the point where his name was trending on twitter because so many sex workers had found out about him uh, or had had their encounters themselves and he was using all these pseudonyms so through this online community they were compiling his all the fake numbers he used and all the pseudonyms he went under to protect people um, and I'm glad to say he's finally been brought to justice and was arrested and charged with rape. Well, this links to epistemological authority and, and voice again, because it goes to show that the voices and testimonies and experiences of violence that sex workers uh, are, are faced with are not taken seriously within you know, the mainstream judicial and, and court system. So their voices are just completely worthless and have no value within that system. I think that's what, you know, those layers of secondary victimization and, and dismissal from the, the legal system and, you know, justice authorities, that's what it's telling us, how society views the, the voices of sex workers and how they how much they they dismiss and don't care about the the violence that 
that sex workers receive, women in general also experience uh, dismissal from courts to a degree that you wouldn't even believe when it comes to gender-based violence and sexual violence. But if you're a sex worker and you experience sexual violence, uh, rape, assault, any violence, then your position is even more marginalised. And there is a narrative that you should expect sexual violence or rape if you're a sex worker. Yes, and this all comes with a, a fear of the police as well, who have been known to, to rape or even traffic sex workers that they that come forward for help. Under this criminalization or partial criminalization models, this is what we're dealing with. People who do come forward are still vulnerable. Um, it's not until we are in a position where sex work is decriminalized that people might actually feel safe enough to report crime and therefore reduce the violence that sex workers are dealing with. I believe when conducting any form of sex work research, there needs to be thought put into what impact will this have on the community itself? How will this benefit them? I am you know, interviewing them about very personal, sometimes upsetting or traumatic things that have happened. How will this benefit them? What what use have I got them for the trauma that they have they have now presented to me? Um, and a lot of sex work research, it really can't answer those questions. Why are sex work organisations like Scott Pep so reluctant to to talk as as researchers like yourself are today? Recently, the university um, had a row around who we should have on our platforms when it comes to issues like trans rights and sex worker rights. Why do you think that that certain organisations that are associated with sex worker rights are so reluctant to engage with universities as, as a whole and to speak at them, even if it's not on academic matters, but even just on their activism and their own experiences? I can't speak for Scott Pepp directly, but personally, I'd say it does come back to, to politics. So Scott Pepp believed that sex work is work and that sex workers deserve protections such as labour rights, um, as well as they oppose the Nordic model. Um, as far as I'm aware, Scott Pepp have been incorrectly labelled as working with so-called pimps or traffickers, and not only is this inaccurate, but um, it conflates sex work, which is consensual, with trafficking, undermining the agency of the, of the sex workers that they represent. Now, um, I, I'm aware that I think Scott Pep work with some managers or people in some sort of management position, which is, is seen as controversial, but um, it's a far cry from trafficking. But unfortunately, this has really tarnished, can accusations like this tarnish Scott Pep in terms of being able to, them being able to come into um, academic places and discuss sex work because they're then having to come in and fight off the same old arguments about decriminalization and criminalization and the difference between sex work and trafficking and making sure we're not conflating the two it becomes tiring and it's a lot of labor for them to have to go through these arguments again and again to potentially quite aggressive questioners the aggression and the constant need to legitimize and explain your existence within a space can be exhausting to the point of of giving up on engaging with certain spaces and i think that that is just such a loss to universities to learning to women's rights and i'm also interested in the ways that this sort of behavior within the feminist movement and universities also replicates that of misogynists so much internalized misogyny anyway yeah. so moving on to Theorists, are there any particular authors that you're a fan of that you would like to share with our listeners today? Are there any particular authors that jump to mind or, or books or articles that you think, yeah, you've got to read that to understand this issue better? Uh, we're really lucky. There's an abundance of great textbook literature to choose from. So from the front line about decriminalization, I'd really recommend Revolting Prostitutes by Molly Smith and Juno Mack. It's the one I, I mentioned earlier. Their writing is really good and it's 
extremely powerful the way that they are able to convey the arguments and push for a, de a decriminalization model. Um, also, Elizabeth Bernstein writes about bounded authenticity, which is really invaluable for understanding authenticity involved in sex work. Um, and also for extensions of this concept for webcamming, I'd actually recommend the work of Angela Jones, um, who pushes the idea of embodied authenticity when it comes to webcamming. It's really, really interesting work. Um, Tila Sanders as well for understanding sexual scripts when it comes to the work, uh, when it comes to clients, um, as well as the paper Who's the Man by uh, Lauren J. Joseph and Pamela Black. And then regarding intimacy, um, Milrod and Witzer's intimacy prism is really helpful for discussions about the extended relationship between sex workers and clients. That's just like a few of them, but there's so many to choose from. Fantastic. What a reading list. So crack on, everybody. <laughs> in regards to intimacy and sex work, I'm really interested in what links and mirrors there are between other forms of of care work and emotionally taxing work and work that involves facilitating other people and giving care and therapy to other people and even customer service roles briefly can you just speak to how you think sex work can be situated within those wider conversations about the commodification of intimacy and the workforce and intimacy how can it be linked with other sectors and industries and jobs that involve uh, intimate care work so i think a lot of sex workers would actually agree and say that sex work is a form of care work it involves working so intimately with a client to to meet their needs i mean some of these clients are really reliant on sex workers um, I mean, I've heard um, anecdotally about disabled clients and how sex workers work to meet their needs or elderly clients as well, um, as well as clients who are just unable to get perhaps their needs from a partner. There are lots of different emotional roles that sex workers take in the lives of these clients to provide the support. Um, I believe that as somebody also did talk about, and I wish their name came to mind, but just about how they just the the intimacy of just touch and the hugs factor in so much more than the actual sex part of the work. The being the closeness is such a factor in the communication that forms a big part of the work, and um, which I think probably most people don't even think of. It's not just a in and out. It's more. It's a lot more to it than that. Which just goes to show again the diversity and humongous spectrum of of work and services that are encapsulated in the term sex work. Like I said, the full service sex worker walking on the street with clients pulling aside them in, in cars seems to have completely disproportionately overtaken the perspective of what sex work is. But just to list a few, we've got sugar daddy work. There's, uh, yeah, there are workers that visit a variety of clients within their homes, such as disabled people, people who have complex uh, sexual or, or intimacy or emotional needs. There are, I've even heard of sex workers that also have a dating role or a girlfriend experience role or some sort of, of talking work role to their job. Yes, the, the girlfriend experience is becoming quite popular at the moment. Um, so that is the idea that you, as a sex worker, would go in and behave like a girlfriend. You'd go on dates together, perhaps you'd get gifts. You kind of know each other on what is seemed to be on a deeper level than perhaps a one-night stand. You would actually know quite a lot of detail about each other. Um, how true this is on either end, you can't really exactly say, but it's that need for intimacy and closeness that it really underpins it. More than the sex part, it's, it's feeling like you have a relationship. And I'm also interested in the, um, the disability element as well, both for the worker and the client, because many customers have disabilities um, and also on the worker end how sex work can be a really um, inviting option for women and, and people with disabilities because 
workplaces in capitalist society are so uh, ableist and so and can often exacerbate people's disabilities um for example um lots of working overtime a working culture that is being like a hamster on a wheel the cultures of bullying and overworking and not having your needs whether that's visiting the doctors or reasonable adjustments catered to so actually sex work can be can provide the flexibility and and respect and uh, adjustments that are needed for disabled people's disabled workers lives and the same goes for people who have other uh, needs and responsibilities in their lives such as uh, mothers and, and single mothers or women who um, have unstable citizenship status uh, which makes it complicated to work the hours that that they need yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the client, there's so many different factors that can then impact why they want to seek the services of a sex worker. Um, perhaps it's that, you know, they can't perform in the way that they are expected to. Uh, and sex workers are would be seen as more likely to be understanding of this. Perhaps it's that they have no interest in maintaining a relationship. Um, there's lots of different ways. I mean, as well as kind of a range of different physical disabilities, um, there's there's lots of different reasons why clients would seek uh, sex workers. Um, and from disabled sex workers themselves, we are really uh, we're at, we have a limited amount of research on disabled sex workers. Um, I've been talking to um, sex worker and disability researcher Riley Nix, who works as a webcam model. Um, and I'm aware that she's been looking into the, the relationship between sex work and people with disabilities, particularly chronic conditions. Um, traditional employment doesn't tend to allow for the flexibility, the, the remote working, the choose your hours that, that sex work does. The current employment is just not disability friendly, and that's leaving a lot of people unable to work particularly with the, the benefit system that we have right now and like um and we're really putting disabled people through having to jump through a lot of hoops just to get any amount of money from the government we're leaving fewer options in terms of employment it's no wonder that disabled people are turning to sex work for to earn money to live absolutely workplaces are so poorly designed for anybody with a disability which is crazy because there are so many people that have so many different disabilities the workplace is based on this very narrowed prototype or blueprint of, of what a person is and you know even the the monday to friday nine to five structure is so incompatible with so many groups within the population, whether that's mothers or disabled people or anybody with any sort of caring responsibilities. I mean, this could be another podcast in itself, <laughs> how ableist um, the workplace is and how that, how that leads to and shapes disabled people's relationships with, with sex work. Yes, it's important to note at where we are at the moment with um, coronavirus that we're seeing for the first time workplaces, schools and universities finally become accessible to disabled people by offering things such as remote working and more flexibility over hours. Provisions that have been pushed for for so long by disabled people are finally now happening because able-bodied people are, are becoming ill. That is at the beating heart of it, isn't it? That now yeah. the significant illness is is affecting able-bodied people i mean not even politicians or members of the elite are are immune from this and and knowledgeable about what what it's going to do and what's going to happen so do you think that's what is is causing the change that we're seeing that is a really interesting perspective i absolutely do i mean i we've seen how many people have been pushing for this kind of accessibility for different work for ages and the need to be able to to work from home for particularly with chronic conditions that have maybe an un, more unpredictable health this is the flexibility that's needed and it's only finally being offered now now that now that nobody's safe yeah, we're seeing all of these leftists and anti-capitalist critiques spring up around, you know, saying 
Well, it has been possible the whole time to have the majority of jobs done remotely and have uh, generous uh, economic programs. We can uh, share food and resources more and and have more benefits available. Uh, we, we are starting to realise that this is a choice for, for humanity. So I'm hoping that the virus will, if anything good comes from it, it will cause a step to the left and a widespread realisation that capitalism doesn't care about you and it's not going to protect you. We need more workers' rights, greater pay, more protections and more flexibilities because capitalism is dancing on a very, very thin thread and operating on a very, based on a very um, risky calculation that at any point can be imbalanced by um, an unpredictable event and that we need protections in place uh, for everybody. So what other sociological analyses are there to be had of the coronavirus uh, when it comes to sex work? Um, how do you think it will affect the industry? And are sex workers, because of the human contact elements often involved in their jobs and their reliance on those aspects of the work in order to gain an income? Um, and of course, the women that are more likely or the people that are more likely to do the jobs that, in, that would entail the highest exposure and risk to coronavirus are likely to be the most marginalized sex workers so can you speak a little bit more about what you what you think is going to happen in the industry and what, what your concerns are there's no research on this yet this is all anecdotally but what we're seeing is that the coronavirus is affecting direct sex work um, and that is anything full service but also includes dancers and is even changing pornography sets things are all over the place at the moment because we don't have um we cannot have that contact and be safe so what we're seeing at the moment is sex workers from different fields of sex work are now looking at camming as an option because that can be done solo from your own home without any direct contact um, i've seen a number of tweets from sex workers considering or starting camming as well as several tweets from those who are already in the industry warning of the dangers of jumping right into the work without considering it because every form of sex work has its own pros and cons and camming like any other does have its dangers so there are people warning of the dangers of just throwing yourself into this this new work so do you think that the clients who as you spoke about earlier who have you know, an attachment or, or reliance or um, gain great benefits from face-to-face -face sex work, do you anticipate that, that they will suffer from the withdrawal of that labour and um, compounded with self-isolation? It's going to be hard to tell until after we're hopefully through this. For the time being, I can imagine more clients will be turning to camming for that interaction, for that face-to-face -face communication. Because like, unlike other forms of sex work, maybe pornography, like camming is interactive. It's a communication. It can be one-on-one -on -one if you choose to pay for that. And therefore, you can start to have that intimacy and that closeness without the need to be in the same physical environment, therefore being a, now being a lot safer. Ah, that reminds me of a question that I want to ask you before we move on to our final area. So do you think that the intimacy that is constructed via a camera and or in the face-to-face -face interactions, the physical interactions that sex workers have with their clients, do you think that we can call that intimacy? Yes, I do. There, there is debate about intimacy and the relationship between intimacy and authenticity. So that is, are we presenting our true selves? And if not, is it still intimacy? But I think most of it, most sex workers would argue that what they are doing is intimate. They are sharing parts of themselves, probably snippets of truth, and they're getting a lot from their clients as well. They're hearing about their clients' fears. They're maybe working through... Um, issues the client had around sex, perhaps the client hasn't had sex ever or for a long time, and they work through those issues. And by doing so together, I don't see any way that that wouldn't be intimate. 
you're learning so much about each other. You're learning each other's kind of fears, um, and you're providing pleasure at the at the forefront. That seems to be the very center of intimacy. So do you think that even if the intimacy is, in inverted commas, counterfeit or uh, disingenuous, it can still be counted as intimacy? Are you saying that intimacy is very complex and can involve both authentic and genuine and more constructed uh, and deliberate and commodified forms of intimacy, which I think we, we perform all the time in our lives um, in work, paid work that is not sex work, we're performing uh, disingenuous, emotional and intimate labour um, towards loved ones. Even sometimes we can uh, perform intimate labour that we don't want to or that is semi, um, semi-constructed in something in a way that doesn't totally resonate with our, our genuine feelings. Yes, I, I would agree. I think lots of work involves intimacy as its core. Um, that closeness, that communication is a requirement for, for so many different jobs, well beyond sex work. Um, it's the trust involved in these positions that I think makes it so intimate. But even at the end of the day, like customer service as well, it's about performing. It's about making somebody trust you and building that closeness. It radiates through so many different forms of employment it's hard to say it's just specific to sex work and even if we look at authenticity as well I don't think we need to be completely presenting our full selves to be intimate I mean if we look at Twitter as an example where lots of people don't even use their real name there isn't they can still form friendships on these platforms they can still kind of communicate daily to learn a lot about each other getting to know each other on quite a deep level all without even knowing their names or where they're from or their age or even their voting history if that matters to them all this can be done without that information and still be intimate i think it's fascinating the links that can and should be made within sociology uh, and, and family and intimacy studies between sex work and care work and emotional work and customer service work. I think there's a fundamental link there. Well, thank you very much for that. And moving on to, so I just have a couple of last questions before we finish up and let everybody digest all of this information. So the first is around students and sex work. So there are lots of headlines coming out around how sex work among students is on the rise. Why do you think that students engage in sex work? And do you think that uh, in the future where sex work may or may not exist, will, will students continue to be increasingly part of, of that picture? So you're right, much of what we actually know about the students who are predicting in sex work is coming from the media and it's coming from those headlines and anecdotal stories but the research on sex work and students is actually fairly new and um, the most comprehensive research is from the student sex work project that found that around one in 20 students are involved in some form of sex work um, interestingly the research also found that that figure was higher for, for male rather than female respondents. So that's 5% of male respondents reporting involvement um, against 34 of female respondents. And I think that's quite interesting and maybe not what people expect. 21% indicated that they'd actually considered working in the sex industry. Um, and as for why students engage in sex work, it offers so many incentives that traditional employment does not. Kind of what we were mentioning earlier, the freedom over the hours, be able to choose your rate of pay. It can be better paid than a lot of the other jobs on offer to students. Um, and we also really need to factor in that higher education is a factor here. So the Student Sex Work Project found that 57% of those who responded mentioned higher education and the cost of that as the, the factor. Um, the English Collective of Prostitutes have stated that they have seen an increase in the calls to their helpline from student sex workers since the introduction of fees. Um, and data has shown that, that women who've been previously unable to seek an education are now able to do so because of sex work. 
So really what we're seeing is that, you know, the more exclusive that universities and this access to education and knowledge becomes, the, the more that this kind of feminized labor will become the way that we are able to access the university, including, you know, basic necessities, like the ability to manage the cost of living while getting a degree. It's, we should also look at the universities, particularly those within the Russell Group, that have been taking measures to limit the hours that students can work. So not only are they failing to take on more working class students, they're now making it more difficult to be able to afford to live and to manage the cost for these universities. And all this really makes sex work such an appealing option. But the less hours and students can earn more than pretty much any of the other jobs on offer, particularly when so many workplaces aren't even offering a, a living wage. Um, what we know from the student sex work project is that students are more inclined to take on indirect sex work. So that's going back to webcamming, um, includes clip sites and even phone sex lines rather than direct or contact sex work, such as the full service. Um, these indirect forms of sex work have a lot less research on them and therefore people are less aware of the dangers that they involve. So just because there may be no physical harm, there are still very real concerns to consider, such as doxing. So that's kind of the finding out of personal information, such as real name, address, contact information, um, stalking, as well as harassment and even scams. So these are now concerns that are facing a significant number of the student population. Um, and kind of going back to disabled students, disabled students who are really underrepresented at universities and they're facing further barriers to employment. So, and the research on sex work and disability is extremely limited. But anecdotally from my research, I found that many of my participants told me about their disabilities and from speaking with them, that they believe that disabled people are well overrepresented in sex working populations. And given the lack of support, and again, there's hoops to jump through, and even this callous attitude towards sex workers by governments, I wouldn't say that this is surprising. It just goes to show all of the double-edged swords and, and double standards, stuck positions that marginalised groups can be in, where they want to, for example, access an education, but they need to work in order to do that, but it's restricted. And they're being forced to, you know, this Tory government have... Um, prided themselves on uh, making as many people who are in, in inverted commas as uh, fit to work but often on insecure contracts zero hour contracts etc that are seriously affecting their their health and well-being and in jobs that often don't pay and uh, for example i used to work for gingerbread the national charity for single parent families and contrary to stereotypes most single parents are actually in work and those that aren't in work want to be in work and for those who can't work it's it's not a question of having enough work experience or uh, not having the motivation to work or any of those ridiculous and deplorable and stigmatizing uh, narratives around single parents particularly single mothers you know it is a gendered narrative but they can't work because they have caring responsibilities for one two three four children and if they do go to work it won't pay it won't pay as much the money that they need and the, the types of works that they can undertake are very limited because of their caring responsibilities so for example picking up from school so i feel all the time when it comes to work in you know this capitalist neoliberal society and um, there are all of these kind of double-edged swords when it comes to work that that means that people seek out options such as sex work so I guess we would have to see the increase of workers' rights and a decrease in or, or a rescindment of capitalist and, and neoliberal orders in order to see a reduction of, say, for example, students in sex work. However, I'm concerned about putting a view, viewpoint forward like that because then, and I, I'm cautious about doing it because then it's it's the language is, is loaded in a way that, that reinforces this idea that sex work is inherently negative, that it's something that needs rescinding and needs reducing. But I'm interested in whether we would see a reduction of 
people going into into sex work if we were to live in a society that had a more left economic order so all of the anti sex work voices say that women shouldn't be going into it they shouldn't be choosing it they should be escaping it and leaving it and those women aren't putting you know the, the voices that are saying that aren't putting the food on on the table of these workers but for many sex workers it's their only viable option in terms of whether that's pay um allowances for disability uh, flexibility right sex work for many reasons is is compatible with people's lifestyles in ways that the workplace that which is designed for able-bodied people um and for for childless people i.e you know men who don't majoritively take on you know sole responsibility of domestic and reproductive labor it's it's designed for men and, and able-bodied people yeah and i think you really tapped into something there that what was known as survival sex work it's hard for that to be empowering when that is your your sole means to be able to put food on the table to be able to kind of live your life now if we had a, a system where people had better access to public services um you know better quality schools they felt that their your, their children were able to eat food for three meals a day maybe they can start to take on work that's maybe less risky or more enjoyable but as we're in this system which puts so many people in a very vulnerable position it's hard for that work to be truly empowering so moving on to our final question and this is one um that i've created because i would love to hear your opinion on this louis saru the famous documentary maker bbc documentary maker recently released a film on on sex work in the uk why are many people boycotting this new louis theroux release so sex workers and researchers are aware that engaging with the media on this topic can be tricky to say the least um particularly if we look at the last documentary that louis did through did on i think it was on the porn one and it's viewed as very paternalistic and unrepresentative of a lot of people's experiences. Um now for this specific new one, two of the participants of the documentary and several others who were approached by the BBC have come forward to talk about their experiences which have been overwhelmingly negative. For instance, one participant says that they were lied to about sex workers being involved in production, which became glaringly obvious when none of the crew knew about Foster Sesta, which is one of the most damaging anti-sex work policies which was brought in in the US. Um there were also instances of racism and ableism as well as the, as well as the withdrawal of consent and all of this just made the documentary seem like it should be boycotted as being unrepresentative and having treated its participants poorly. Uh I did actually watch it and there is often a very homogenized representation in documentaries like that about sex work sex workers experiences and it fails to capture joy at all like anybody sex workers experience joy and sadness in their work a bit like i i was on a panel the other week and there was a uh trans playwright on the panel who runs a uh, a thespian a theatrical group for uh, trans and non-binary people and they said one of the key motives for setting up the group was that they are sick of seeing trans lives constantly portrayed as this drudgery and yes trans lives do involve large degrees of marginalization and discrimination and serious violence but trans people are also normal people who experience all of the emotions that there are to experience and they said that the the objective to the theatre group was to focus on what they call trans joy which is the joys to be experienced from being um, a trans person and having this unique journey so i wonder whether a similar um 
analysis can be had of the portrayal of sex workers, where it's it's always p- portrayed as this drudgery, and actually, like any human experience, is um, is is a mixture, and like all spectrums of um, of economic and social situations, depending on where you're observing the sex work industry in the world and and what workers you're looking at, you will see a variety of experience. So, and and the same is to be said of of all industries. So I wonder, yeah, if there's anything there that, that stands out to you. What sells in the media tends to be the big headlines, the ones that make the whole industry sound dangerous or depressing that's what's going to catch people's attention. However, I have noticed also on the flip side, as a researcher, that many of my participants have put forward what's almost kind of a too shiny view of sex work. And there is a reluctance there to mention the negatives. Um, I imagine partially that will be because I'm sure it's not particularly enjoyable to discuss you know, the more sensitive aspects or maybe negative experiences. But I do believe that involved in that as well, there is a inherent kind of responsibility not to portray the, the industry as dangerous in a way that would potentially harm their community through these policies that will um, roll back rights for sex workers. Um, so it's kind of a balancing act there. Absolutely. And the pressures and expectations that sex workers have to live up to in order to even be given access to space and access to voice are so disproportionate to to any other group of people so i agree there in order for sex workers to make sense almost and and be understood within a space they have to fall within this dichotomy of either a a victimized um, prostitute or a um, a liberated, uh, you know, independent woman in the sex work industry, whereas the reality is um, often a mixture of the two. Yes, absolutely. So I think we're going to finish up there. I just have one uh, question for you to wrap up. If you could change one thing right now, about sex work research or the sex work industry or the relationship between feminism and sex work in any of those areas sorry i know that's uh, really (laughs) massive what would you change what jumps to mind i would like feminists en masse to listen to sex workers to take what they say seriously listen to their concerns listen to the joys of the work and the negatives of the work and push for the right response to sex work that actually helps people who need it. So I would like to see more nonviolent communication being used in the feminist movement where we treat each other with empathy and compassion and understanding. And we see our differences as adding to the feminist conversation rather than, um, rather than something that's diluting to the conversation. I would like to see the, the feminist table widening up for, um, for, for women of colour and sex workers and, and trans people to all come and, and be welcome at the table. So that's what I would like to see change, some um, more nonviolent communication. I couldn't agree more. So, yeah, this was Eva Duncanson, a PhD sociology researcher on sex work and cam girls at the University of Edinburgh, and Poppy Gerard Abbott, PhD uh, researcher in sociology as well, uh, looking at sexual violence in universities. So, please continue to watch my YouTube channel. I've got more videos and audios and podcasts coming in, um, and I'm sure Eva will again be um, a guest or a wonderful feature of those. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening.